being recorded. From Lakehead University School of Nursing in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I will be your monitor, moderator for the next hour. Today's webinar is titled Integrating a Mental Wellness Curriculum into the Second Year of a BSDN Program. So I just have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. I want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and it will be made available online after the session. A link will be sent out to all registered participants along with an evaluation of today's webinar. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions from the audience. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time during the webinar. And I will do my best to get through as many questions as possible after the presentation and before the hour is up. Our keynote speaker today is Ms. Sarah Stevens, and it's my pleasure to introduce her to you. Sarah is a registered nurse and a clinical instructor at the University of British Columbia Okanagan School of Nursing. Her clinical background is in acute psychiatry, mental health emergency services, emergency room mental health consult, electroconvulsive therapy, and early psychosis intervention case management. Her scholarship activities include mental health and intentional learning. Also joining Sarah today are a couple of her nursing students. So we have Tori Banner and Jordan Salt, who will speak to their experiences with this innovative curriculum. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Sarah, for your presentation. Wonderful, thank you very much, Kristen. So hello everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to do this presentation today. I'm very excited to share with you our revised mental health curriculum at UBC Okanagan, which is in Kelowna, BC. Uh, I'm a member of the Chasm Nurse Educator Mental Health Interest Group, and we identified that mental well-being and positive psychology seem to, it seems to be on the radar these days. So we had a discussion regarding incorporating mental wellness curriculum into nursing education. And I'd like to share with you how we accomplished this at UBC Okanagan in our curriculum. So I have a lot that I want to share with all of you today. And I've kind of come to terms with the fact that I won't be able to share everything. So I hope that we can get through the basics of our curriculum and have lots of time at the end of the presentation for questions, discussions, and um, for the students to share more of their experiences. So. Um, I'm looking forward to that discussion at the end. So, okay. the slide is not advancing. Oh, there we go. So, as uh, Kristen mentioned, I have two students with me today, Jordan and Tori, who'd like to share their experiences. So, say hello. Hi. <laughs> hello. <laughs> A uh, huge thank you to both of you for coming out today. So I'd like to invite Jordan and Tori to share their overall opinion of how the course went before we get started. So maybe Jordan, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure. All right, so um, before going into the mental health practicum, um, I had no idea how much mental health was integrated into all of the other areas of nursing. Um, I believe that mental health is the backbone to all nursing care. De-escalating strategies, therapeutic communications, um, deep listening, et cetera, are all skills um, learned in the mental health nursing that can be integrated into my other nursing practicum. Uh, before entering the McNair unit, I was both nervous and even a little bit scared of what I was going to encounter. Um, just because there's a lot of stigma around mental health that causes people to believe that those who are suffering from mental illness are dangerous or even unpredictable. But once I was on the unit, I was really surprised to find out that talking with patients was, a, was as if having a normal conversation with another person on the street. So throughout the weeks, um, I was able to engage in deeper conversations with patients. And I, I was able to see that what patients really appreciated the most was being able to tell their story and how they feel and to be really listened to. And this has shaped my idea of nursing, the fact that it was not only about doing your tasks, such as dressing changes and medications, et cetera, but also engaging in these therapeutic conversations with patients. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. And Tori? Um, okay. So mental health has really benefited my nursing practice. 
Um, I found that the course was really challenging, but in a positive way. I have seen my own personal growth, and I've also been acknowledged from my instructors as well. Um, so for me, starting off in my first year, I was very timid, very shy, and I had a hard time just walking into a client's room. So when they challenged us this year with talking to someone, a stranger, I was incredibly horrified. Um, but I was able to start that conversation, and I found myself to grow a lot from the first conversation. And in the second week, I was challenged to meet with someone that was younger. And it was a really uncomfortable situation for me, and I saw that the client felt the same way. And so that was beneficial before going into McNair. So I found the way that they structured the curriculum that we didn't start off in McNair right away was beneficial. And as well, the suicide simulation. Unfortunately, I didn't participate in the violent simulation. Um, but when we did get to McNair, it was a really incredible experience. And it started off really scary. But I was able to, by the end, do a full mental health assessment. Um, I found it was structured really well. There weren't a lot of high expectations to stress you out. Um, there were lots of opportunities to explore different mental illnesses, and the clients were all very open to sharing. Um, I think the curriculum was set up perfectly. I enjoy that we didn't start out in McNair because I don't think I would have been ready for it, and I think I speak for a lot of the nursing um, class on that. The progression of the semester worked nicely to prepare me to meet with those people with mental health illnesses, and we were able to learn about mental what mental wellness looked like and understand how it contributed to a person's well-being. And um, learning about that prepared us for how disturbances in mental well-being would lead to mental illness. Awesome. Thank you, Tori. All right. So, get my PowerPoint here. So before I get started on discussing our new curriculum, I'd like to briefly explain our old curriculum. And, oh, the format looks a little odd, but sorry about that. So in our previous uh, BSN curriculum, we had a four-week psychiatry rotation in third year. It was a relatively short rotation looking at acute psychiatry as a specialty area of nursing. Its main focus was on mental illness, treatments, and the mental status exam. And so prior to revising the curriculum of our program, uh, we did an environmental scan, which supported the notions of an early need for mental health education, um, so moving it earlier in the program, um, as well as a focus on health promotion and prevention. So, moving on to our revised curriculum. Um, so in our revised curriculum, we recognize that every person has a mental health. And a patient can have minimum mental health or minimal mental well-being in the absence of mental illness. So if you look at the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the diagram, you can see that it says a person who has no diagnosable mental illness but who has a low level of mental well-being. So I really like this diagram and how it kind of explains how we structured our curriculum. So mental health really cannot be a specialty area. It's everywhere and with all patients. Our practicing nurses need to have the skills to be able to identify patients who are struggling with their mental well-being, uh, adequately assess them, and intervene appropriately when there are concerns. I think we can agree that many patients in any area of nursing are experiencing some kind of stress. Uh, there's tons of research to say that stress will impact healing. And the mind is very powerful, and it can influence our patients' physical health outcomes. Um, an example of this would be like the placebo effect and how, and how the mind can you know, change the outcomes of the, of, um, the patient's health. So how do we help our patients move from minimal mental well-being uh, to optimal mental well-being? So this, um, to, develop, to develop these courses, we looked at different models of positive psychology. Uh, positive psychology is a relatively new field of research showing exponential growth in the past decade. And it's the study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. 
So in essence, we're trying to help all of our patients achieve maximum mental well-being. Uh, the PERMA model shown here comes from Dr. Seligman's work in positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. I've added a slide of resources at the end of the presentation for those of you who are interested in learning more. Um, he also has a TED Talk for those of you who like TED Talks. Um, so in our revised curriculum, we have our first year BSN students take a semester of smart nursing education focusing on their own mental well-being and stress management. Uh, so SMART stands for Stress Management and Resiliency Techniques. And our mental health lecture and clinical are now situated earlier in the program, and we have expanded the number of hours in the course. So this is in relation to the fact that we, we see it as um, something that the students need to have earlier in the program um, because of the the prevalence of mental illness, as well as um, being able to apply this to all, all of their patients. Um, so in our mental health clinical, we have the first half of the semester focusing on the right-hand side of the diagram, patients and clients who do not have a mental illness but have minimal mental well-being. And this is what the structure of our, of our course looks like. Uh, we start the semester by hosting a multidisciplinary trauma-informed practice workshop. So we combine all four of our clinical groups and invite social work students and graduates. And we host it on the weekend so that it doesn't interfere with course schedules. And we try to make it very um, interactive. Uh, the following four weeks, we focus on self-esteem, self-compassion, emotional regulation, positive social support, spirituality, and resiliency. And for this uh, first part of our course, we wanted the students to interview clients who do not have a mental illness, but who may be struggling with their mental well-being. So this year, we did something a little bit new, and we decided to have the BSN students interview students on campus about their mental health, which was quite interesting. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of the slide there, Students start their mental wellness projects um, at the beginning of the course, and they slowly work on them. I won't be able to explain everything. Oh, this is, oh my goodness, what is going on? OK. Darn, it cut out my picture, but I had this beautiful picture of the climbing gym that we went to uh, as one of my favorite weeks. Uh, we had the students complete a bouldering exercise. So the, this is a metaphor for helping our patients to solve problems and provide positive support. Um, so I will let yeah. I'll let Jordan and Tori share their experiences of the first half of the semester. Um, Tori, do you want to share your experience of the climbing gym? Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was really personal what happened to me when I was climbing at NICE, and it gave me a very positive outlook, and it was a really incredible experience that I have carried with me throughout the entire semester. Um, I was in, really enjoying climbing, and I got to the top of one of the walls, and at the top of the wall, you can either climb over or you can drop, and so I made it to the top, and I was struggling, and I sat there, and I felt stuck, and I had peers at the bottom that were encouraging me to go over, but I was still terrified, and I was ready to let go. I looked over, and there was a man who was working out in the gym that saw me struggling. And when he saw me struggling, he came over, and he sat on top of the wall, and he sat there and encouraged me. He didn't grab my hand, but he simply used his words. He was able to engage in a conversation where I was able to calm down, and when I did, I could pull myself over to the top of that wall. It was an incredible learning experience, as he did not physically help me over the obstacle that I was facing, but he used his words and he shared that experience with me. I now think about the situation when I see someone struggling. For me, it was a physical obstacle to overcome, but for people with mental illness, it's a mental obstacle. And I tried to incorporate this way of thinking when I was in McNair to understand that when people are facing a problem, there's something they need and then there's something that is the best thing I can do for them. I think it's an, there is an important balance between knowing between not doing enough and doing too much for someone. 
at NICE, this man was able to demonstrate to me that balance. If he had just come over and pulled me over, I wouldn't be here sharing this story. But because he encouraged me to overcome it, it changed it completely for me. Thank you. And Jordan? <coughs> Um, sorry, one thing I should probably mention, um, Tori mentioned McNair, and that's our acute psychiatry unit at the hospital. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so um, I also talk about the climbing gym, but at first I'm just going to touch on um, the first few weeks. So when Sarah said we introduced a lot about how health is in the public, so when I tried to ask deeper questions about mental health issues, which students didn't really seem to want to open up, but um, I asked about mental well-being, and it was this, um, the students, they opened up and they said they had good mental health and these strategies to keep their stress levels down and seemed to be a lot more open about it. Um, and then for the experience of the climbing gym, um, I thought it was eye-opening for how social supports can affect a person's mental well-being. Um, so one of the tasks that we had to do was go across the climbing wall transversely, so from side to side. And I decided to go first in my group. Um, it was a bit stressful <laughs> being the first one to go. Um, but everyone, all of my classmates behind me were cheering me on, and <clears throat> I felt very confident and supported compared to if I was just doing it by myself. Um, so I believe that this metaphor that of going to the climbing gym was a great example of how social support can work in a person's life. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, halfway through the semester, we then switched to the left-hand side of the diagram uh, to the mental illness spectrum. So as Tori mentioned, we do simulation in our program. So before the students enter practice in acute care, they complete two simulations using standardized patients. Um, the first one is a suicide assessment with a patient who has depression and self-harm wounds. And the second simulation, which is on a different day, is a medical patient who wants to be discharged. And uh, the patient, we have to use um, de-escalation strategies in order to prevent a violent situation. And next one here. So then we take the students to an inpatient mental health unit, which Tori mentioned is called McNair. Uh, half of the students work on their mental well-being projects, while the other half are on the acute care unit. Um, so this is to accommodate our large group. So we have 15 students in our clinical group, so we weren't able to bring all students onto the unit, so we broke them into two. Um, so now in acute care, students have the tools to assess their patients' mental well-being, as well as perform a mental status exam. So. Um, so now for the exciting part, which was one of my favorite parts of the program, was the mental well-being projects that the students presented. So at the end of the semester, the students will present their mental well-being projects. So this is um, what the mental well-being projects looked like. As I mentioned, students begin working on them at the beginning of the semester. At the end of the term, they present them to their target population. We have four clinical groups, so we gave each clinical group a different target population for their project. Uh, my clinical groups were children and adolescents, so we took our presentations to the elementary and high schools mostly. There were a couple of exceptions. And um, here are some examples of their projects. They had PowerPoint presentations. They engaged the students with activities. And they made uh, stress balls using balloons and either rice or flour. You can see the little smiley face um, in the middle of the slide. And uh, they made brochures. They made handouts. It was very creative, very well done. I was very impressed. Um, and then we also had excellent, excellent feedback from the schools. Um, and we really did see uh, like a student's 
participated well. The, like the elementary and high school students participated very well, and they could really relate to these mental well-being topics um, because they can relate to emotional regulation and coping and stress and resiliency. And they learned some of those words, like some of the students didn't know what self-esteem means. And um, so it was really, really, really interesting, and I think it was impactful as well. So now we can get Tori and Jordan to discuss their projects and what they did. So who wants to go first? I can go first. Okay. <coughs> Jordan. <laughs> so um, I was in a group of four students, <coughs> and we presented to two by five classes. So it was a total of 40 students. Um, our project was three hours long, so we, in the first half, we did a PowerPoint presentation, but it was a very interactive uh, presentation where we asked questions and all the students were super excited to answer. We would give out some candy. Um, and then in the second half, we went through stations of um, de-escalating strategies and emotional regulation um, <clears throat> groups. So overall, um, our experience went very well. Uh, while presenting, we found it amazing that so early in education, these children already knew de-escalating strategies for their own emotions, other ways to keep calm, and when to ask for help. Um, starting teaching mental well-being at a young age can impact the person, help them to have good mental health in their later years in life. It was really great to see the children enjoy the activities such as mindfulness, stress while making, and coloring. Um, as nursing students, we left there feeling fulfilled, and we knew that um, being there with the children, they had learned something new, and they could carry that with them into adulthood. Um, not only did the children learn that day, but us as students, we were able to see how grateful other people were to learn about mental health and mental well-being. And overall, it was great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jordan. And so Tori has a different experience, because she wasn't actually in my clinical group. I I was with her on the acute care unit, and so I didn't actually see what her project was. So, okay. Um, for my mental health project, we chose to we we were assigned young adults um, to educate, and so we chose to do um, positive coping strategies because it was right around the time of midterms, and it's a very stressful time at the university. So we set up a room, and we had three different stations with three different um, positive coping strategies. And we were able to bring in students, and we kind of bribed them with food, which every student loves. And so it was really interesting to see they came in, and they were very shy. And once they started to make a stress ball, and they started to talk more and open up more, which I found was very interesting. Um, I didn't have any lectures or PowerPoints because I figured as a student I wouldn't want to go somewhere and listen to someone talk at me for 10 minutes about positive um, coping strategies. So we simply just asked them a few questions, um, true or false. Um, I remember one of the questions was, do you think that all stress is negative? And a lot of people thought that all stress is negative, and so we were able to educate them that there are some good forms of stress. They don't happen very often as a student. It's mostly negative stress. And so we were able to educate them on different ways to cope better. And I know that um, a lot of the students really appreciated the stress balls. There were people that were short on time, so I was able to make a few ahead, and um, they could take them with them. And they were very appreciative of that as well. And so my peers presented on two different um, coping strategies. So one of them was the use of aroma therapy, which is very common on the university campus. And I was able to learn about that as well because I wasn't sure. And the other one was the use of sound. So it was very cool to see the tension kind of go away as the students left. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tori. All right. So, um, oh, plans for the future. So 
Uh, I just wanted to quickly mention that because we have mental health in second year now, and it's really focused more on mental well-being, we, um, I don't know why this slide doesn't look nicely, but uh, we do have an optional fourth year mental health specialty course that we're creating. So we haven't had the fourth year of our new curriculum yet. It's going to be starting up this summer. And the course will have a six-week lecture, as well as an optional fourth-year mental health practicum. Um, so in order to take the, the practicum piece, then you will have to have the lecture as a prerequisite. And I'm really excited to have this specialty course, because I think that in the old curriculum, having the four weeks of mental health, it really wasn't enough um, to work in um, in mental health after graduation, you needed more. So this will provide that for those students that do want to end up working in mental health as a registered nurse. Yeah. Uh, a few acknowledgements here. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the hard work that was put into the curriculum revision by our School of Nursing. Uh, Barb Pesset, the curriculum review and MSN curriculum revision lead. Sheila Epp, our curriculum review and co-lead and BSN curriculum revision lead. Um, I've chatted to Sheila a few times about this presentation and she was very agreeable to um, you know, sharing the secrets of our curriculum with all of you. So I'm really grateful for that. I'm really, I'm really happy that our school is so open to sharing our ideas and hopefully that everyone was open to sharing and we can you know, just improve nursing education across Canada. Um, I'd also like to thank the UBCO School of Nursing Steering Committee, the Undergraduate Curriculum Committee, as well as the faculty and clinical assistants who were involved in, in the revision. Um, again, I talked to Sheila about this, and it truly was a team effort in the school. Everyone put in a lot of hard work. So thank you very much. And um, Dennis Chasper, he is the faculty lecturer for the mental health um, lecture component. So I'm, you know, obviously grateful for him as well. He, we, um, he also teaches, he teaches two of the clinical groups and I teach the other two clinical groups. So we, we talk a lot about what we're doing and we, um, it's just great to, great to work with him. Next slide here. Um, we are ending early, which I did not, I did not anticipate that happening. So I have, I have left time for questions and discussion. Um, I also have a whole bunch of slides that are resources and kind of references for, uh, for those who want to look back on the presentation um, video and be able to click on the different links that I've posted. So I'd like to maybe open it up as um, um, maybe open up like a, the poll question. Um, then, I don't know why this looks so awful. Okay, this is supposed to say, what year of the program does your university offer mental health or psychiatry? Um, if everyone would mind um, just putting in the comments box, uh, either first, second, third, fourth, or we don't offer a specific course. We'd really be interested to know what everyone else is doing. Sure, well, and I Sarah, I wonder if I could ask um, a question for you here. Yeah. The first question is from Shahin, saying thank you very much for the presentation. Really enjoyed hearing the student perspective. One thank you. One student voice, how shifting from task-oriented practice to therapeutic conversation help them to understand mental health patients. And so just wondering, how does the curriculum support informing therapeutic conversations? How do we support therapeutic conversation, conversations? Yeah, so when do they learn about it? Uh, what types of strategies are they encouraging students to use? Mm hmm good question. Um, so we have our relational practice courses uh, throughout the whole curriculum. And um, so 
Besides that, in the first few weeks of the course, of the mental health course, uh, we really talk about those communication strategies such as, you know, looking at your body language, your tone of voice, your, um, you know, your posture, your eye contact, uh, and doing a lot of self-reflection on those pieces. Um, so for me personally, I, I, put it, um, I put it on the student a little bit more to say, you know, here are lots of resources to say this is what good communication looks like and this is what um, some of those non-therapeutic communication strategies look like and getting them to reflect on their strengths and some areas to improve, and then supporting them throughout that process of, um, you know, helping them to work on the things that they want to improve. Um, so that's my perspective. But uh, Jordan or Tori, do you want to comment on that a bit more? Um, yeah. So also during the first few weeks of the semester, um, I was in Sarah's clinical group, and it was actually really interesting. We did simulations and we recorded the simulations and so by reviewing the recordings we were able to see um, the effective communication strategies that we had put forth and then the non-therapeutic ones as well and we were able to reflect using those I think was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I have a I have a communication tool that was given to me by our lab and sim coordinator and so I really went off of that communication tool to say to the students that this is kind of what the expectations are going to be and then getting them to reflect on it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Anything, Tori? Um, yeah, I think that it started out really strong in our first year of nursing, we did have the relational practice as well as the smart nursing course and those both contributed to um, the start of the therapeutic conversations and then it was really instilled in us when we started out in the mental health course. We were shown what it looked like and given many different tools to allow us to develop further and encouraged to um, really have those conversations not just in the mental health course but as well as in our acute care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I haven't really talked about much is this year we also took a lot of those um, mental wellness assessments and gave them to the acute care um, nursing clinical instructors as well so that the mental health assessments became also part of the head-to-toe assessments that they did in acute care. Very nice. Does that answer the question? Yeah, wonderful. So it looks like most of the people who responded to your poll said that their curriculum for mental health is in third year. In third year? Okay. Okay. And my next question then is, does anyone offer like any positive psychology content in their nursing program? So yes, no, we're not sure. What it says there. And also wondering if it's something that other schools are interested in. Sarah, are there some examples of um, foundational concepts in positive psychology that might kind of tweak people's uh, minds in terms of where it might be in their program? Sorry, can you say that again? Are there some key areas around positive psychology that, that might get people thinking about how it might be already in their program, but maybe they just don't call it that? Yeah, that's a good question. Because hmm. really we focus on like the, remember that PERMA model that I, I showed there? So, you know, positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, accomplishments. So, you know, positive psychology is is a fairly new concept, I think, in in healthcare. So, I'm not really sure of any examples. So, while those are coming in for the poll, I do have a comment about someone being interested in whether or not or how this new curriculum has helped the students to maintain their own mental health and well-being. 
Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, I should probably also mention that in our mental health lecture component, the students do like a self-reflection project as well. So maybe I'll let you guys, I'll let the students speak on behalf of their experiences with that. Um, well, just to start off, at the, at the beginning of the year, we have that trauma-informed practice. And so um, during that, we go through a lot of um, emotional regulation techniques that we can use throughout the semester. So I found that very helpful. Um, as there was a lot of techniques that I had no idea I could do, and they did actually help me throughout the semester, such as coloring or stress balls or um, pause practices and mindfulness. Um, but anyway, so then in our lecture, in our mental health lecture, <clears throat> we had um, mental health projects. So we had to do um, a four-week project where we um, put forth doing um, something that would help our mental health. So um, my project, I wanted to do emotional regulation strategies. And I um, started out with two a week, and then I went up to five a week. And it, um, we had to journal about our experiences and how it helps with our mental health. And I think overall, um, I was able to use strategies, and my mental health was good throughout the semester. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so for myself, I did a mental wellness project as well, and I started out with meditation, um, which is mindfulness. They talk about it in our first uh, first year, first semester, and they encourage us to use it throughout the nursing program. And unfortunately, I wrote it off in my first semester, and I was like, this is ridiculous. I don't know why they're teaching me this. It's not helpful. And so when I actually sat down and started to use it in second year, I started to see the benefits. Um, so I decided that that was something that I was going to begin in my everyday um, practice. So I started out the five weeks with meditation. And um, it was very beneficial overall. And I, it helped me with emotional regulation. I kept a journal of, I started out with every emotion that I felt all day long. And it was incredibly hard to write. And I found myself writing the same emotion. And I wasn't really understanding why I was feeling the emotions. So I changed it to writing about um, the things that stressed me out in the day. And I found that as it progressed, the things that would stress me out were a lot more infrequent. So I noticed a definite change in that. And, and that kept my mental wellness very high and even going through midterms I I went through some personal issues as well during the school year and that really helped me to just stay focused and I really don't know where I would be in without it honestly thank you very much another question here from Jane is positive psychology similar to strength-based I would say that it does have some similarities. Um, so, Jane, is that in regards to, I'm guessing, um, strength based for patients, right? So looking at the patient's strengths. So I would definitely consider consider that, but I, I think that it's more than just that, right? So if, for example, like the PERMA model, um, strength based would kind of be more maybe engagement or accomplishment. So there's, there's quite a bit to it. Um, when we, in, in our program, we would probably talk about resiliency. Um, when we talk about resiliency, that would be the strength-based piece of it. Um, but we also talk about spirituality and self-esteem and self-compassion and um, emotional regulation. So there's lots of pieces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And Jane, you can also add that it's also about viewing the client as the expert. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Would you guys agree that that's what we focused on a lot? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. Even as the mental health instructor, like I never go into a conversation thinking that I know more than the patient does. So. Mm -hmm. 
We also have a comment here from Lise. He says that he feels mm -hmm. this is a, a, a total look at clients in from a global perspective and feels that this is very client-centered care. He found that being a in being a teacher, therapeutic communication seems to be the area that most students have issues with. So using scenarios and recordings and analysis afterwards seems to bring uh, a broader perspective um, into different approaches to improving their therapeutic communication. So she thanks you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I agree that therapeutic communication is is a huge piece of nursing and you know up until now I don't think that like we definitely had it in our curriculum but I don't think that it was ever really evaluated from a from a practical sense mm -hmm. which I think we're doing now Also, another question from Lise, when do you bring in the mental health forms and rights advisory into the curriculum? Oh, good question. So we do that, um, you know, we kind of discuss it a little bit throughout, um, but the last, I think it's the last, um, the second to last week, so in, when the students are in acute mental health, we do mood disorders and anxiety, the next week is psychosis, and then we uh, focus on addictions, and then the next week is the Mental Health Act and Ethics. So, and then we do personality disorders after that. So, it's I guess week 11, week 12, something like that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had one question myself. I was just wondering if you could. Tell us a little bit more about the SMART nursing course that I think you said was offered in the first year of the nursing program? Mm hmm for sure. Let me just go to the slide. <laughs> oh dear, this is, does not look right. Uh, so this is the positive psychology resources here, so a little bit more about that. Uh, and then here is the UBC Okanagan SMART nursing curriculum, so stress management and resiliency techniques, and uh, UBC of Okanagan's nursing program has put its stress-reducing mindfulness training to the test. The School of Nursing is committed to health and wellness and SMART curriculum represents an exciting opportunity. I'll let you read the rest. Um, but here are a couple of links um, to show what we're doing. And uh, there's a YouTube video where our instructors kind of go through, you know, why we're doing it and what it looks like. So, Wondered if maybe the students could, could comment on their favorite stress management technique or resiliency technique that they learned as part of that smart curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I guess for me, I wrote off that course in the first year. I didn't see that it was important to me, and um, that's my biggest regret. But now looking back, the pause practice is probably the most important thing that I learned in that class. Um, so it's just taking one minute or two minutes, however long you think you need, to just pause and let everything fall away. And um, I now find myself doing it in so many different situations. Like if I find myself driving somewhere and I'm really frustrated, I get to a red light. I don't close my eyes at the red light, but I just sit there and I let everything go away. And I understand like why I'm frustrated and I am able to let it go. And it's the same thing in um, clinical practice. Like if I find myself getting flustered over a medication, then I just, I take that minute that I need to really clear my mind and then go back to what I need to be doing. And I think that's the most important thing that I've learned. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can agree with that. Um, we did not just learn it in the smart nursing curriculum, but I feel like we have it with all of our courses. Um, <clears throat> our instructors, like right before our midterms, they will get us to do a pause practice um, or just any stressful situation. And I agree. I think that it's probably the most helpful thing is the, the mindful pieces there. And I, I do find myself doing 
uh, the deep breathing practices quite often or a pause practice um, before I have a test, and it, it really helps. So, yeah. We did a pause practice before this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. I wondered, um, there was the one comment about that you, you said you didn't really buy into some of these concepts and now you wish that you did. Do you think there's anything that could have been done differently in the curriculum so that you, you might have appreciated it at the time or do you think that it, it was just about maturing and growing and sometimes you just can't be told that things are going to be useful till you realize it for yourself? Um, I think I was just being stubborn and I had um, judgments about it going into it and um, I was, I just thought it was ridiculous that I was supposed to bring a yoga mat to class and lie on a yoga mat and the entire time I was sitting in that class I was thinking this class is costing me $500 and I'm basically taking a nap. So it was really frustrating to like have to do that and then um, just getting over that like mindset I I think it was partially the maturity I wasn't ready to do it and then also seeing it like actually participating in it in the next semester and the next year like in this year um, before my exams and that's when I really started to see it benefit me I really wish that I would have started sooner but Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's another question here from Lise. She asks, if in the SMART program, is this where complementary approaches to coping strategies are discussed? Things like stress management, uh, sleep, anger, and anxiety. Yeah, good question. So I think really the, like I took the, the SMART curriculum as an instructor. Um, luckily, our instructor for this course opened it up to faculty as well, which was very nice. And, you know, it was really a focus on the neurobiology as well of, you know, what's going on in your brain when you're experiencing stress and um, kind of the, the ways to kind of get, get control of your own mind. Um, and I think that that's, that's really what it was focused on. Um, it wasn't really talking about like sleep or there was some anger, anxiety um, discussed in that course, but really more on that neurobiological level to say that this is what's happening in your brain when you're experiencing anger and stress and you know trying to prevent it from happening by doing these mindfulness techniques. Any other things to add? I know that we were to keep an anger um, diary, mm -hmm. but I don't remember how it applied. I remember writing about the things that made me angry, but I don't think that there were any tools that they gave us, not that I remember, to deal with the anger. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember along with the anger, my anger diary was just for a week, but throughout the entire semester we had to keep a log of how many mindfulness techniques we did or stress management that we did throughout the week. Um, I think that maybe it applies in the, the anger diary such that um, if you used any techniques that it helped your anger. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, with the mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, what the literature kind of says is that if you practice it for eight weeks, then you'll see an improvement. Um, so I'm thinking that it was probably in relation to saying that this is kind of what your mind was doing at the beginning of the course and then slowly being able to see um, it improve and being able to kind of recognize your, your triggers for anxiety and anger and be able to kind of cope with it. Thank you. So we have a comment from one of our guests. Thank you for a very informative webinar. It's especially useful to hear about specific learning activities and to hear from students as well. So uh, thanking you for the presentation. And, and, and maybe with that, we'll, we'll wrap up today's presentation. So I would like to thank Sarah, our keynote speaker today, and also the students who joined us, Tori and Jordan.
I'd also like to thank Allie and James from Tazin who assisted us with the webinar and all the technical details. And to also to all of you online who joined us and uh, and generously donated some of your your busy day to hearing about this wonderful curriculum. And I would encourage you to please take the time to complete the evaluation when you receive it. We really want to hear your feedback on today's session. 